just let me start with one remark. CAI has nothing in common with Chai, because everybody was asking me, so it was a bit surprise for me at the beginning. And also let me say one thing. We are a, we are a startup studio, which basically means that we are trying to uh, build a lot of startups when it makes sense. And today I will focus on one which is called Merlin Intelligence. It's a fintech startup, but besides uh, Maryland Intelligence, we also have one called Health Mode, which is optimizing clinical trials. Uh, another one is called Tower Street, that, that is uh, focusing on uh, cyber risk assessment. And then uh, we have also one called, uh, yeah, I always forget what's the name. It's, uh, the abbreviation is BNB. It's a little bit more complicated name, but it's, uh, it's focused on a smart appraisal of buildings. But uh, let me start here with the actual talk about uh, how we use ML to detect money laundering. Uh, and let me start with a few numbers. The first one is uh, $342 billion. It's quite a lot of money, right? And this amount of money uh, banks paid during uh, the years 2009 to 2017 to regulators uh, because they breached what they required in terms of compliance. And this actually uh, amounts to $38 billion annually, which is, you know, to give you some idea, about half of the Romanian national budget, which is quite a lot of money, right? So major part of uh, this compliance requirement, you know, uh, requirements given by regulators is something called KYC or uh, know your customer. Uh, just let me put one thing straight. It's not about, you know, you uh, being, you know, stalked by a bank trying to figure, figure out whether they should provide you with a mortgage or not. This is rather about this kind of guys coming to a bank and trying to open an, uh, an account, right? So let's say you have a guy that comes into a bank, he has a suitcase full of money, and he tries to open an account. And you cannot know whether, uh, by any chance, he was not a mayor of a town somewhere on the other side of the world. You cannot know how many businesses he has if he you know, doesn't tell you, and so on. So, if he, by any you know, chance, would want to launder his money or do any kind of other financial crime using your bank, then you need to avoid this because otherwise those regulators would charge you quite a lot of money. Individual fines for this kind of you know, uh, mistake for a bank can go up to $2 billion, which is something that happened uh, in 2012, which is again quite a lot of money that can just you know, destroy your business. So when this kind of guy comes into a bank, you want to know whether he had some political exposure before, whether uh, by any chance he's related to any, let's say, risky business like casinos, nightclubs, or whatever, whether he's somehow connected to, let's say, North Korea, or whether he was not like previously uh, you know, sentenced or somehow accused of uh, financial crimes. This is how it could look in, in reality, right? Uh, let's say we have this guy, uh, Tomohiro Ishikawa, coming to your bank, and he wants to open an account. And for what you can do, actually, is that you can first check whether his name and his details are not in one of those official lists of sanctioned people. Or what you can also do is that you can uh, check all possible sources of news, let's say from newspapers and so on, and check whether there is some information about him being dangerous or risky for your bank. Or eventually, if you decide to open his account, but you are still a bit unsure, you can you know, monitor his transactions or somehow see his network of contacts and, and so on. That's uh, actually something where Maryland Intelligence, our fintech startup, comes to play because uh, we do exactly this. We uh, allow banks to, or not only banks, but you know anyone who can use this kind of software or a solution, we can allow them to enhance their process so they can, you know, ensure uh, 
better quality or uh, the higher efficiency of this whole process of screening people and seeing whether they are risky or not. And like, even though we have a, quite a lot of modules that goes together, today I will focus on something that we call negative news uh, screening, which is exactly the thing I was mentioning. And that's you get a name, you get some details, and you go through really a lot of articles seeing whether he was mentioned somewhere you know in in those articles and let's say there was a you know newspaper article saying that back in 2005 he was a uh, you know uh, in a, in a board in uh, in uh, in Tokyo for example and he did some fraud or something if you are a analyst or an officer in the US you just cannot know whether he was uh, this kind of guy or not this is how it can look in, in, in our product, just to you know, show you some, like something you can really imagine. Uh, as I said, you input his details, and it takes like three minutes, and you get a long list of articles uh, sorted by, by uh, relevancy, which is, let's say, the risk that this guy could mean to your, for your bank. And then we also help people to focus on, uh, on important uh, stuff in the article, so we are somehow highlighting the important parts of the article. Well, how it usually worked in banks before this kind of solutions using AI or other NLP techniques uh, came to the uh, market, uh, it was pretty simple. You have a database of a lot of articles. Uh, you use the name of the guy, you search through the articles, then you have a set, a huge set of keywords like murder, fraud, uh, accusation, uh, nightclubs, North Korea, whatever. You use those to search through the news database and then you just, you know, take this list that is sorted not using any specific you know, uh, methods, but just those general information ret retrieval methods you can use, for example, in Google. And he just reads through 50 or 100 top articles, which is not really bulletproof, right? And then he needs to read each one of those articles through. Then he writes a report on this. Usually, they even printed it. And then they took the whole folder with those 100 articles, with the assessments, and they passed it to someone else in the bank, right? This whole process for one single client took up to two hours. And in a, let's say, bigger bank, it can be from hundreds to thousands of people doing this a full -time, as a full-time job, just reading through the articles. And why they would even want this kind of solution we can offer? The first thing is that we are not going to substitute those guys, uh, you know, analyzing the, the articles and reading it through, but we are rather making their lives easier, right? We, we enhance the whole process. Uh, the first thing is that those guys are just not able to focus on, on the work for eight hours and there is a high probability that they will miss something. Also, if you highlight only what's important in the article. They can just skip everything else and see what's really important to them, which is making the whole process even faster. You can reduce the, the number of articles that are not really you know, in, containing any risk for the bank, and you can just skip them. And at the, end, at the end of the day, you also avoid missing any important articles that can, you know, that can hide somewhere you know, really deep in the list of those articles those people should read just because it was not sorted in a, in a smart way from this KYC point of view. So let's see how you can approach this whole thing. Uh, first, I, I mentioned how those banks did it previously before all those new technologies and deep tech stuff came to the market. And, and this is, let's say, a, a small step up uh, because I will show you a simple baseline approach that you can apply to, to solve this. So let's say you, we would start with the same thing uh, as the guys in the bank. Uh, we have a like, really big database of articles. You search for the name, which is not so easy because uh, you know you, it doesn't need to be exactly the, the name as it is you know in the form, like Tomo, Tom, Tomohiro Ishikawa. It can be also just Ishikawa, it can be Mr. Ishikawa. 
like quite uh, popular thing in, in uh, Spain or Portugal is that you have a really long name, but you just pick a few of those that are used. And even though there can be two people with exactly the same names, they picked different sets of those names. And if you somehow you know, change those pieces, nobody would know that you are talking you know, about the, the guy. So let's say your name is A, B, C, D, E. And then you say, OK, so my name, let's say, in shorter version would be A, E. And the other guy says, OK, I have the same name, but I want to be B, E. And if you just by any coincidence say, you know that those names are different, or like that they switch them. You you aren't going to find it, and, and that's one of the like big problems in, in this name matching thing. Then also you need to uh, find the keywords in those articles. Uh, then you somehow score, let's say using some really simple way, what's the position of the keywords. You can say, okay, look, if the keyword is just next to the name, let's give it a high score uh, to this keyword or to this occurrence of the keyword. If it's pretty far, just you know, give it quite low score, and then somehow aggregate it. What you can do is you can say, OK, if the keyword you know, is next to it, uh, next to the name, you would get, give, let's say, three points to this article. When it's pretty far, you would give just one point to the article. And then you sum it all together, and you apply just some function that squeeze it to, you know, to, the, to the range from 0 to 1, and then you somehow rank it. Right, it's, it's pretty simple, but when we applied this or when we Im implemented this just to set some baseline, we were pretty surprised that it was actually working pretty well. So that's something you can implement even by yourselves, maybe tonight, and you get, you get a solution which is actually better than what they use in a, quite a lot of banks even now. But I guess you can imagine uh, where are the problems hidden here. For example, here we have two sentences. Both uh, contains the name of a screen entity. Both contains the, the keyword, which is here, arrest. And one is like obviously risky for the bank. And the second one, like bank doesn't care what's your, or when you, is, when you are going just to open the you know, account, they don't really care whether uh, you had a, some hard issues or not. The same thing can be here. If uh, if you were sentenced by judge, that's a serious problem for, for, for the bank, right? But if you are a judge and you sentence someone, the bank doesn't care. So, and again, the, the like, name mention is just next to the keyword. The keyword is totally the same, right? Uh, and this is something that you can see pretty often. Well, and this leads us to the question whether you can actually use ML to to like improve this thing because obviously there were some problems with the context uh, of the sentence and so on. There were a few constraints that we needed to, to think about when we tried to implement this. One of them was that speed matters. If you have a client that came to a bank and he wants to open the account, you don't have so much time to process the whole thing. And, and like, the usual answer for when do you need this or what's the you know time frame is usually like we want it now. So if you if you you know reiterate a bit, you can go to you know that you can spend a few minutes to somehow process the whole set of hundreds of articles. That leads us to the to the limit that we cannot afford to spend let's say one second or more than one second on one single article. That means that you cannot just use some you know, deep learning, mumbo jumbo, uh, state of the art stuff that takes 50 seconds to on one article. Another thing is that every single client, I mean, bank, uh, different companies, they have a different perception of what the risk means for them. For one of those, uh, the thing that you own a strip club can be a problem. For for uh, for a different bank, it can be totally okay, right? So. Another thing is that you cannot just train a model which would apply for all the banks. You just need to, to reach some level of uh, configurability. Sorry. And also, the banks or the clients have different perception of what's you know risky for them. They have a 
like various, let's say, risk adversity. So also you need a lot of configura configurable numbers somewhere in the configuration file that you can change there and back uh, as, the, as the bank decides. And the last thing, which is not less important, is actually that all of this is required by regulators, right? And those regulators want to be sure that the bank does it in some reasonable way. And regulators doesn't really like black boxes. So if you say, look, I have this whole solution right here, and I don't really understand what it does, the regulators are not going to be happy, right? So you need to also reach some level of explainability so that the regulators and also the like people in the bank can actually understand what's happening, more or less. So, uh, we are talking about machine learning, right? And you, I hope, know that for uh, machine learning you need some, uh, some data. And since we, we had those requirements here, uh, let me say one more thing. Uh, it leads us to the idea that we should try to approach this as a sentence-level classification because it's fast enough. Uh, you can explain how it works to, to the most of the people in the bank. And uh, so the basic idea was, okay, so have a sentence, then have a like small black box, let's call it machine learning black box for now, and then we would like to have a number between 0 and 1 that would say, okay, I guess that the probability of this sentence containing some risk related to the person is, let's say, 75%, right? So for this purpose, we collected some data set. We had a lot of sentences containing risk related to an entity. Also some sentences obviously without the risk. You can see some of the sentences I showed you before as an example. And then, as I mentioned, the idea could be to, as this small machine learning box, use something which is called recurrent neural networks or as LSTMs because we previously had this problem with the context and with understanding the language and so on. So we thought, okay, uh, LSTM, which is, for those who doesn't know, you can imagine it as a special kind of neural network that can somewhat remember like what was, what was happening before in the sentence. And it's also quite suitable for uh, solving you know, various problems uh, containing sequences. So you can, you can see it here that we have this sentence, Judge John sentenced Amy Jones for bribery, let's say, and you feed it word by word into this solution, to this black box, and at the end you get a number, you know, predicting the, the probability. But the problem was that we found out that we don't have enough data for this. Uh, we found out that there are still so many things that can happen in the sentence. There's so many uh, you know, ways how you can express that there is some risk hidden in the center, in, you know, related to the person, that we just found out that we cannot, uh, you know, the, the performance was not enough for us. So we started thinking like how we could approach this, how we could help ourselves, how we could get more data, because the data we needed are quite, you no know, specific, and most of the times you need a domain expert deciding whether it's a like, risk for the bank or not. But we thought, okay, so maybe the problem is in how we train the, the network or the, this black box whole time. What if we started with some, you know, something easier for the box or for this black box and then we somehow changed it at the end? So the idea was, what if we trained just, let's say, a repeating parrot. You have a sentence on the input, and you expect totally uh, like identical sentence on the output. It sounds pretty easy, right? Uh, for those who are a bit more familiar, it's something which is called autoencoder in the field, which, as, uh, as uh, well, this is the, the, this is the picture or the schema uh, I showed you before, so it would basically means that instead on, on, on this input, which we could say are words A, B, and C, and some prediction, we would say, okay, we don't want this prediction. We rather want to predict the same sequence here, right? So after inputting ABC, we want to get ABC on the output. 
So it seems pretty easy, right? But the basic idea here is that you first need to feed the whole sequence into this black box. That's the first part. The black box or this neural network needs to somehow remember what was the content of the sentence. And then you say, OK, now just repeat it. Which basically means for the, for the neural network that it needs to create some kind of representation. You can imagine it as, a, as, some, as some kind of converter that takes your sequence and transforms it into a vector of numbers. Usually in the field, you can see vectors of, I don't know, of, of the length 128, 256, maybe even a bit more, but those are the ranges it usually, you know, it's usually around. So what we have now is something that is able to read the sentence you had on the input, represent it as 128 numbers, and then, again, you have the second part that reads those 128 numbers and converts it back to, to, to this you know, sequence. Which is exactly what we wanted. And when you train this, you have something that has a pretty good idea how the language works. You have something that is able to you know, represent the meaning of the sentence. And also, which is pretty good, is that you don't really need any specific data on this. What you can do is you just read through the whole Wikipedia, you take sentences from Wikipedia, sentence by sentence, and you just train this on it. And then the last part is that, as I mentioned, you can imagine it as two parts. You can throw away the second one. We, are not really want, we don't really want to somehow you know, generate the sentences back. But we are really interested in this first part. It's you take the, this converter from text to numbers, and the idea is, let's take this output, or, or this you know, representation of this sentence, at one more layer of some computation, and try, again, what we tried at the beginning. Meaning, let's take a sentence. Here, for example, for example Judge Amy Jones sentenced John Doe feed it here into the network, get the meaning, and then say, OK, my wish is that we get negative answer on, on this sentence on the output. What is the difference to the previous approach is that before we had only, let's say, thousands of sentences, and the algorithm, the, the neural network, was just not able to understand the language from those few examples, right? But when it read the whole Wikipedia or any other text source you have, it got a pretty good idea what, you know, how the language works. And thanks to this, it's much you know, more capable of you know, understanding this and giving you good predictions. Well, and so that's basically what I said. And we reached exactly what we needed. So now what we have is a like let's say an algorithm that can read sentence by sentence and for each of those sentences it can say how much it can contain or what's, how it's predicting the probability that this sentence is actually having some risk related to this person you know, uh, containing uh, itself. Then, uh, let me say one more thing, you just go one by one, you collect those scores and then you can either do something simple as uh, what I described before, you just sum it up somehow, you somehow shuffle it, or you can use some, let's say, more advanced ranking methods. You can somehow extract features from those uh, predictions, and you can, you know, continue with this. Just to show you how much, uh, how much uh, difference, just this small change switching from this keyword-based approach to this machine learning-based approach using the same aggregation method uh, can make. I will show you this graph here. Basically, the blue columns are keywords, or this keyword-based approach. The green columns are uh, this machine learning approach. And then, for most of you, I guess, uh, those metrics will be uh, familiar. But let's say that if we aggregate those, the, the you know, benefit or, or the advantage of this approach added like 15% to, to, to those metrics. But what was even more interesting for us is 
that, and we can see it here in this other part, that for some specific fields of, let's say, questions or risks for us, let's say this one PEP, PEP, which actually means politically exposed person, it had even much better results. And what's even better about this is that all the time I'm talking about English here, but actually we need to apply this on, on Chinese, on Turkish, on, uh, you know, a lot of other languages, uh, for example, even Japanese. And we need to ideally use the same approach to all of those languages so we can scale. So actually, similarly to, to this better result, we were able to improve even the, you know, this Chinese solution. Uh, the previous one was just uh, some chart uh, we had from our own testing, but we also had a third party that tested our solution and they compared it to, uh, let's say, log legacy solution from, from the customer and they found out that when they switched the solution from the previous one to one that we designed, uh, there was 60% decrease in the articles they, where was no you know, risk related to the person and uh, those analysts read it, you know, just, you know, because they had to, but there was actually no need in it. And then we found out that there are even 13% more articles that they would just, you know, end up somewhere down in the ranked list of these, those articles. But we were able to take them and put that up in the list. So actually those analysts can find this out. And the last point here is, uh, this is just a small piece of the whole puzzle of this whole KYC puzzle. Uh, it's not only about you know, screening one article and reading what's in there. It's also about creating, let's say, something as a, uh, we call it villains networks, uh, which is not anything uh, related to neural networks. But then, when you can read those articles and analyze the content, you can do a lot of like, fancy stuff, which, especially for me as a machine learning engineer, it's really cool because I have a lot of toys to play with, right? So uh, when you go through the article and you find all the names and perhaps you can even see who the person sends you know, trans transactions to and so on, you can start building the graph of, let's say, uh, relations, which then means that if you had a guy uh, that came to your bank and there is no information about him in the news, it doesn't mean that he will just slip away. It can mean that we will find out that he's somehow related to another guy who is also quite okay, but then they are both related to a company that had serious problems. And then, thanks to building this graph of relations, you can eventually get pretty good idea whether he's the villain or not, or maybe hidden villain. Okay, and that's all from me. If you have any questions about uh, KYC or this anti-money laundering stuff, I think that uh, it will be better to reach out to me later on because we are running out of time. But definitely, you can email me or you can find me on LinkedIn and I will happily discuss any, anything we talked about. Th thank, thank you, you very you. much, Marek. Highly appreciate it. <laughs> and please, please do take advantage of him as he made like a 14-hour trip here. We should definitely get the maximum value out of Marek, so please abuse him with questions after, after this. This was very interesting. <laughs> Thank you.